Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing in the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your host, Master Captain Angie Scott. Hey everyone, Angie Scott here, host of the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast. This week, we have another special treat for you as we welcome back Rosie from Rosie's Bait and Tackle. Uh, if you guys might remember uh, from an episode of a while back that Rosie has recently been appointed as the new kids correspondent over at the Fish Nerds podcast. And our friend, once again, crappie hippie John King allowed us to share this awesome segment that Rosie did. Uh, an interview and uh, Rosie brings a, a fresh perspective to the world of fishing and outdoor adventuring. So we're thrilled to be able to feature her exclusive conversation with children's book author and avid fly fisherman, Mr. Andrew Weiner. This delightful chat is sure to inspire the little anglers in your life and ignite a passion for fishing and conservation. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation between Rosie and Mr. Andy right here on the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. Hey everyone, it's Rosie and today we're interviewing Mr. Andrew Weiner, author of the amazing children's book Down by the River. Mr. Andy is an avid fly fisherman all the way on the other side of the country in California. We have always loved the story he wrote about a family's fishing adventure and memories. So much that we had to share with you. Let's talk to Mr. Andy. Hello, Mr. Andy. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about your book and fishing. Really happy to be here. All right, let's do the questions. So, first up, Mr. Andy, what inspired you to write this book? I love fishing, and I can tell that you love fishing too. And I have had a job working in publishing for many years, which means that I sell books to bookstores. And I've sold a lot of children's books over my long career, and I love children's books. So I thought maybe I know enough about books, and I know about enough about fishing that I actually could write a story about fishing. And from the time I started writing it to the time that it got published, it was about 15 years. It took a long time. But um, just proves that if you stick with something, just like art and story, if you stick with something, you probably succeed. Yep, I agree. All right, so I've got another quick question. Who are you in this book? Are you the boy Art? Are you now even grandpa? Not a grandpa. Um, I would say that I'm probably Art, um, because I started fishing around the same time that Art started fishing. I actually grew up back east. I grew up in New York, and my family would take vacations up in Maine, and we would fish in lakes up in Maine, and I fell in love with fishing from the very first day that in those days, I threw a worm on a hook and was catching fish in a lake. So it's something I've really loved for hmm. how many years? 60 years, maybe, because I'm a lot older than you are. <laughs> we have been fishing up in Maine. That's where Rosie caught her first striper. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. We love Maine. It's beautiful up there. Mm-hmm. Indeed. All right. So now... I got another question. Why do you think it is important for people to see families, especially young kids, fishing together? I think that it's such a healthy thing to do, both physically and mentally, and it's so fun. And the things that you can do with your family when you're growing up, it's the very, very best thing. And then as you get older, it's still the best thing to do. Rosie, do you you have a brother or sister? Yes, I have a brother. His name is Rex. <laughs> and how old is Rex? He's five. <laughs> and do you fish with him? Yes. Ah, that's so cool. You guys, you're going to be fishing together for the rest of your life. I yep. hope so. <laughs> All right. How long have you been fly fishing? 
Can you tell us what got you hooked? Good pun. (laughs) Um, I probably have been fly fishing for over 30 years, something like that. And the story behind it is my wife and I went on a trip uh, to visit her mother and her mother's husband. And my wife and I were going to uh, stay in a cabin up in the mountains, in the Sierra Mountains. And my, my wife's mom's boyfriend said, why don't you borrow my fishing pole? And he gave me his pole, which had a regular spinning reel on it. And he said, and take some of these flies with you. And he had tied the flies. And he gave me a little bubble that you could use to float the fly. Like a casting egg? Exactly. Exactly like that. And um, so there was a, a stream right where we were staying. And I hadn't fished in a few years. And I went out and it just had like a, I had a streamer and a woolly bugger. Mm-hmm. And I caught a bunch of fish. And I thought, this is so great. Now I remember why I loved fishing so much. And I was working for a publisher, and we had a sales conference back in Vermont. And I decided, I knew there was a river nearby, and I knew we were going to have a free day. And so I brought the fishing rod, and I brought the bubble, and I brought the flies, and a couple friends of mine and I went out, and we fished on a free day. And I caught a fish. I caught a fish at a sales conference, which was amazing. (laughs) And... One of my friends lived in Seattle, and he said, you know, that's not really fly fishing. You should get yourself a fly rod and a fly reel and some waders, and I'll meet you in Montana, and I'll take you fly fishing. (laughs) And so we went up to Missoula, Montana, and we went fishing in Rock Creek, which is a very famous river, and I caught my first trout on a fly. I fell in the river for the first time and got (laughs) soaked in my waders. Um... And it was just so beautiful and so fun. And from then on, I've almost exclusively been a fly angler. I love it. It's the best. Um, When you go fishing, do you do catch and release or you catch and eat or do a little bit of both? Most of the places I go, you're not allowed to keep the fish. Mm -hmm. So I, I would catch and release those fish for sure. But even when you are allowed to keep fish... I can't remember the last time I caught a fish. And I like fish to eat, but I know that it's important for the resource and for the health of the fishery to, to keep those fish alive so they can breed and there can be new generations of fish. And I think for the most part, people understand that and they, they do that. Do you catch or release or do you keep your fish too? Um, well... We only keep what we need, but we do do a little bit of both. I've done a lot of a lot of deep sea fishing when I was younger, when I lived in Southern California, and my dad and I would go out on boats and we would catch rockfish and things like that, and we would bring home a lot of fish and we would make fish cakes and cook fish fillets, and it was delicious. Yeah. Um, mm. And up, up here in Northern California, I was on a trip with my father-in-law, and we caught a couple of big salmon. Ooh. And we brought those fish home. And we <laughs> ate those fish. They were delicious. We, we grilled them with a little bit of salad dressing on it, like Paul Newman's Italian dressing oh, as yeah. a marinade. It was delicious. It was delicious. Oh, you're making my mouth water. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. That is one of Rosie's goals to catch a salmon, but dad yeah. likes dad likes to do the maple salmon. Yes, that's the oh. best. That would be great. We recently went to a trout unlimited community meeting about the sustainability of the fishery in Rhode Island, specifically the decline of the river herring. It was very sad. Do you have any concerns about this country's fisheries for the future and any ideas for keeping it healthy so kids like me can continue to enjoy the delight of fishing? You know, it's funny. I was just on vacation, and I went up to Idaho, and I went to a Trout Unlimited gathering, too. We saw that. We did. I, (laughs) I think Trout Unlimited, they do so much great work because, like you, I do have a lot of concerns for the health of fisheries. Um, There are so many things that have impacted them and reduced fish populations, reduced the health of watersheds. I actually think one of the great things that people can do is join Trout Unlimited. Um, A family, and they have youth memberships, 
and they do so much great work for conservation, and they teach everybody how they can be responsible as well. At this this Trout Unlimited rendezvous, I got to sit on a, in on a couple of programs, and I was so impressed with how knowledgeable they were about the work that they do, and and how practical the work that they do is, so that they actually are doing things that have an impact and can help restore fisheries so that they'll be around for generations. And that's actually one of the, the aspects of my book, Down by the River, that the place where the family fishes is somewhere that, as a family, they have fished for a long time, and it's still a healthy place, and there are still beautiful, beautiful fish there. And the fact is that if we don't take that responsibility, if we don't do that work, it's not going to be there for future generations, for your kids, Rosie, and your grandkids. Mm-hmm. So we all have to work together to do that. Exactly. Yeah. I'm so glad you're interested. I think I should start my own community to help fish when I grow up. I think you should. On Instagram, there are phenomenal women anglers. Yes. Many of whom I've gotten to know and, and have met in person. And they inspire me so much. And I know that they're better fly anglers than I am. <laughs> I'm not proud about stuff like that. And they're exactly the kind of person that you're talking about, Rosie, where they care about conservation They care about teaching other people how to fish, sharing the love of the sport. They are great, great people. I posted a picture that I think you guys liked on Instagram of a book by Cheyenne Orbis. Cheyenne is one of the very, very best people, and her book is wonderful. She's awesome. inspires me. Did you want to continue? Of course. All right. So here's another question. There are about 80 flies beautifully illustrated in the cover of the book. Miss April really did a great job making fly tying look like the art it truly is. Have you tied any of the flies in the book? I'm laughing because I have a confession, Rosie. I don't tie flies. See these little hands? They're just not good for tying flies. And I actually love going to a fly shop in town when I'm traveling and saying, what flies should I be using, and then buying the flies. But I'll tell you the story about the flies in the book. Um, When April was starting to illustrate it, um, I had to wait a year because she had LASIK eye surgery and her Um, eyes were a little out of whack. Um, And I was saving all sorts of pictures from fly fishing magazines. You know, what does it look like when there's a fish on your rod and it's bent? (laughs) And what does a beautiful river look like? And then I bought her maybe two dozen flies that I thought were sort of essential flies to use. And I gave them to her. And as she started sketching them, she fell in love with flies. And she posted a video when she was doing the work. And she had one of the flies and she said, flies are so cool. So she went out and bought more flies. And instead of 24 flies in the book, you're right, there are almost 80 flies. And there are no repeats. Um, And I know that a lot of people, when they share the book with their kids. Tying the flies in the book is a project that they do. So it's a a really great impetus for people to begin tying flies. Maybe someday it'll be an impetus for me to start tying, but probably not. Want to learn about fishing, hunting, and outdoor gear from fellow experienced outdoor women, as well as get inspired to try something new in the outdoors? Then subscribe to Adventurous the only women's hunting and fishing magazine. Adventurous is a high quality print magazine that receives rave reviews and it also makes a great gift for other outdoor women and youth. Subscribe at Adventurous Magazine and use code WOMANANGLER for 15% off. Here is our final question. What is your favorite fly to fish and favorite place to fish? Well, you don't have to tell us the exact spot. Maybe just tell us the body of water. Okay. I would say my favorite fly is a purple haze, which is a parachute atoms with a purple body. Um, It's sort of a go-to. And people say if the fish aren't biting on a particular kind of fly that, you know, maybe there's a hatch coming off. If there's a fly that you feel confident in, that you just like fishing it, chances are you're going to catch fish with that fly. And purple haze is definitely one that is a favorite. Huh. In terms of places I love to fish, my favorite place 
that's hard because there's so many favorite places that I have. Two days ago, I was up in Northern California, north of Truckee, and there's a stream called the North Yuba River. And there's a particular spot that I absolutely love. And I started taking my girlfriend there because I'm not married anymore. I just have a girlfriend now. And she has fallen in love with fishing in that spot. All the spot also. <laughs> uh, and when I was up there, unfortunately on this trip, the runoff had just started and the river was really high. So I didn't catch any fish, but I was so happy to be there. But aside from that, there are places in Montana and New Mexico and Idaho and Colorado, California. I just, I love to fish. So there, I'll tell you about one more place. Near Livingston, Montana, the Yellowstone River, there's a thing called the Mother's Day Caddis Hatch. And it doesn't happen on Mother's Day. It usually happens just before that. And I was fishing one year, and there was a stream, a, a section of the, of the river that I waded across early in the day. There was nothing happening. And then at like 1 o'clock, 1.30, suddenly the air was full of millions of caddis. And suddenly the water, it was like a popcorn machine, and things were just popping everywhere. And it was fish coming up and eating these flies off the surface of the water. And it was it was incredible. Wow. And I kind of took a look at where I was, and there were two cottages. And I kind of drove back around to where the cottages were, and there was actually a little inn there. And I ended up staying at that inn for maybe six times. And I could walk out the back door of the cottage to my favorite spot to fish on the Oston River. To me, that was sort of another of my very, very favorite places to fish. We've actually been to Yellowstone before, like not the river, but we mm. went to the place where there are all those geysers. And, and we it, did it, a yeah. little bit of fly fishing and we caught a few tiny browns, right? Yeah. There is great fishing in Yellowstone. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this because it's not like it's an, an unknown place. My favorite stream to fish in Yellowstone is called Soda Butte Creek. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very accessible. Um, it's right off the road. And this is a terrible thing to say as an angler, but it, people drive by, and if you've got a fish on when they're driving by, it's kind of a cool feeling <laughs> that people are watching you and you've caught a fish. Um, and there, there are terrific fish there. And there are bison right nearby. There are antelope right nearby. Yeah, we've actually it's seen an bison. entire herd of bison by the road yeah. once. It's great. I was actually fishing in something called Slough Creek in Yellowstone, and I was all by myself, and suddenly I looked upstream, and there was a herd of buffalo making its way down towards me. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder what this is going to be like. <laughs> and what I've heard is that if you are where they're coming to, they're fine with it. But if okay. you go to a place where they are, they're pretty territorial they're not and okay. it gets dangerous. <laughs> so you just have to be really smart about it. But they just, you know, they came downstream and they walked around and they were on the other side of the river. And I have some pretty great photographs of it. Yellowstone is amazing for things like that. It's it just is. what great experiences. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful place. And really beautiful. Well, that is all the time that we have with Mr. Andy for today, Rose. Um, Mr. Andy, do you have any closing remarks? Would you like to promote any of your upcoming projects or new chapters coming up in your life? You know, the thing that I, I do a lot is I raise money for fly fishing associated nonprofits. And, you know, I, I do work with one really in Serenity which works with anglers who are working their sobriety and working on substance abuse issues. I think that's a great organization, but there are organizations like Casting for Recovery, which work with women who have had breast cancer or who do have breast cancer, and Real Recovery, which works with men with cancer. A really great one is the Mayfly Project, and they work with foster kids. They take foster kids on free fly fishing retreats, and what I do with my book, sell copies of the book and raise money for all of these different nonprofits. And at the Trout Unlimited rendezvous that I was at, they allowed me to sell some books and I got to um, have everybody make a choice of whatever nonprofit 
they wanted money donated to. And there were a lot of different ones that people chose. Yes. Um, so it was super fun. That's great. There are all those flies. I see them. Yes. My top favorite of all of them is the <clears throat> fluttering blue damsel. Nice. I've, I've never, I've never even fished that. We um, haven't, but it's our favorite, I think, in the book, and we're looking forward to tying it. Mm-hmm. But there she are does. flies in this book that we have used and we've been successful on. Dad has caught many rainbow trout this year on the San Juan worm and the woolly bug. Oh, yeah. San Juan worm is a classic, for sure. And, you know, in the back of the book, mm-hmm. there is information about fly fishing as a sport. Mm-hmm. about conservation, yes. and also there are acknowledgments and dedications, and when you have a chance later on, read read those ones about my mom, ones about my dad, and ones for my friend John, who was the person I mentioned before, who said to me, you know, that's not really fun. <laughs> so he got a special thank you in the book. Excellent. And now one of my favorites of these is the gray ghost streamer. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Yep. Well, we wouldn't be here without John. So, yes, he deserves a special, special thanks. Yes, he does. Indeed. Hey, Rosie, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. It was really fun and did a great job. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you again so much, Mr. Andy, for taking the time to speak with us. And thank you for writing such a fantastic book. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. I have to tell you, I mentioned the Mayfly Project, and the man who was one of the founders of the Mayfly Project, he calls me Mr. Andy, too. (laughs) So you're in good company. (laughs) Well, Mr. Andy, we will talk again soon, for sure. And we will let you know when the podcast is coming out. I believe it's it's slotted for June. And um, Mr. John will reach out to you um, to talk to you more about Reeling and Serenity. Um, for sure. And, and maybe someday. If you're on the we'll East Coast, yeah. definitely give us a and call. Rosie, you, you can show me how to cast a, what was your favorite fly? The gray ghost, maybe? Yeah. Ooh. So that cool. That would be good. And I'll, and I'll show you my purple haze. And maybe we'll a, I could teach you a little bit of fly tying. <laughs> maybe you could. But I'm stubborn. <laughs> But maybe you could. I'd love to watch you tie. That would be fun. Bye. Bye.